Hi, I'm Elizabeth Ellen Carter, historical romance author, and I have with me today Emily Royal. We're both in a new anthology coming out on October 21 called Upon a Midnight Dreary. And this is a fantastic anthology full of romantic and spooky tales from Dragonblade Publishing. Um, good morning, because you're in the UK. Yeah, <laughs> and, and good you evening today, evening. Emily. <laughs> you're in Australia yeah, it's, a, it's a horrible grey morning or in Scotland I think we call it dreech which means just grey and yakky and misty and horrible so uh, yeah not, not a great day today but never mind but very ghostly I'd have thought it, yeah it is quite spooky it's a bit of a mist on the hill opposite so um yeah my ghost is probably wandering around there at the moment <laughs> Um, what did you think when uh, Catherine suggested the uh, the Halloween anthology and, and gave us the brief of of picking a, a ghost from the United Kingdom and basing our yeah. stories on that? Um, I, I thought the brief was great because it was quite um, it, it was quite loose because it was just pick a ghost story that's got a bit of romance in it based on a real life ghost so um, I quite like briefs that aren't too aren't too restrictive so you can kind of make up what you're what you're doing um, but I had yeah I had an obvious choice of ghost because we have a local ghost um, that, that haunts uh, a palace in the village that we that we live in a kind of medieval palace and I, I can actually see that palace from this window I can just see the turrets that sort of peeking, oh, wow. peeking over my neighbor's, uh, my neighbor's roof so it's pretty obvious that I was going to pick um, pick that ghost and there's not um, there's not much about her on the internet, there's a few kind of local local tales, but she's just rumoured to haunt the tapestry gallery gallery in the in the palace. And the story is that she's um, she's a woman who's waiting for her long lost lover who's gone off to battle and hasn't hasn't come back yet. Um, and that's that's all I could find on the story. And there's a few other sightings that have happened around the village, like sort of mists have appeared in local woods that have kind of, kind of morphed into the, the shape of a woman. Um, and there's a hotel, which is like an old coaching inn, where um, I think a headless ghost of Mary, Queen of Scots, has appeared towering over a couple in the four-poster bed that they, <laughs> they sleep in <laughs> in the morning to, to welcome them first thing in the morning. Because um, the palace that's haunted by the ghost is somewhere where Mary Queen of Scots spent a lot of her childhood as a hunting lodge, which her father, James the Fifth, I think, um, used to go to quite a, quite a lot. So we've got a kind of estate and lots of hunting grounds and this amazing medieval palace. So it was, um, yeah, it was a bit of a no brainer, really, which ghost I was, I was going to choose, my, my local ghost. <laughs> Fantastic. So what, what did you do from, from that point is, is it, uh, you know, are you introducing a, a couple or are you providing a backstory to the ghost tab? How did you go about uh, writing um, that one? A, a bit of both. Um, I, I used a couple from my series Headstrong, Headstrong Hearts. Um, and it's a, it, it's a series where it's a family where this, this man has made an absolute ton of money. So he's kind of risen through from poverty and he's trying to get into London society and he can't because he's got a very humble background and he's trying to marry off all his siblings to titles to kind of elevate the family's social status as well as their, their wealth because it, that will help his business because he's running a bank. And his youngest sister is a bit of a bit of a hellion, she's a bit of a feminist, but she ends up marrying, marrying a duke who, um, and he's quite unconventional as well. And he's a Scot and he's inherited this title through being a, a distant distant cousin and there's no, there's no other heirs. So I thought I'd go with that couple because they live in, live in Scotland. Um, mm -hmm. So I had this story where they could come and spend a vacation in the village because it's quite, it's quite touristy, our village. So it gets really busy in the summer because loads of people come to see the, the palace and all these kind of ancient medieval houses which are in the, um, in the village as well. So I thought, yeah, I'll put those two together and put the, um, have the ghost haunt them and do various, um, various spooky, spooky things. Um, so what I had is that because the, the heroine is quite a bit of a feminist, um, she's quite antagonistic as well. So she's just quite a flawed character. I like to write flawed characters. <laughs> so she's a little bit discontented with her, her role as a wife and a mother. Um, her husband runs a, a business. He runs a whiskey business because it's kind of recently become legitimate in the in the UK and she wants to get more involved in the business but she can't because she's a woman and she's she's not happy about about that I mean she loves her husband and she loves her children but she's still a bit 
a bit frustrated. So she's slightly malcontent when she goes goes on this holiday with the husband because he's going to go on a business meeting and she's stuck back in the village with the, with the kids. Um, and this ghost is, um, I then built around the tale of, of the ghost, just a little bit of backstory about who the ghost's long lost lover with. Um, and the hero in the story bears an uncanny resemblance to the ghost's long Ooh. lost lover. So it's a little bit of a love triangle where the ghost um, thinks that her long lost lover has come back, but she sees this discontented hellion of a wife who is obviously in her way of getting her getting her lover and she wants to be reunited with her lover and there's, there's one way that a ghost can be reunited with a living being and we all know what <laughs> what that is so um that's sort of where we are and then sort of a few spooky things start happening and the ghost is is obviously a little bit more malevolent towards the heroine because she sees the heroine as, as sort of an, an obstacle to her lover who's not treating her lover properly and things kind of escalate from from there so it starts off quite quite happy with a, a couple that's sort of a, a little bit at odds with each other but you can tell that they love each other and then it sort of starts to go downhill a little bit when the ghost starts targeting the, the heroine and then it all comes to a big climax in a, in a spooky wood at the end which is one of our local woods as well so I used loads of local landmarks and things when they were touring touring the village so um that was that was lovely because it was easy to imagine it because this I just walked up the hill and I the hill that they walk up I'd, I'd done it the day before so it was, it was really easy to picture it and imagine it and describe it so I had great fun with it <laughs> that, and that must be especially fun because uh, a lot of what we write I mean especially since it's Regency and there's London and all of that it's sort of it's very rare to get the opportunity to to then walk into your, your hometown and go, yeah, my couple will have, have gone down this street or up this hill or through this forest. It's um yeah. Did that that did that impact on you? Because because uh, Emily Murdoch um says she she feels this gravitas of 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 history going down some of the uh, uh the the towns and villages where where she lives around Bath. Uh, do you find the same where you live? Um, yes, yeah, certainly where where I am is a, is a, is a ridiculous amount of history, which is in um, yeah in our village. There's loads of things that have happened to the palace as well. I think it was sort of partially destroyed during the Cromwell era. I think the soldiers mm -hmm. kind of ruined part of the part of the palace, um, and actually, it's still bits of it are still in ruins. So it still feels a little bit spooky. Um, it's not fully inhabited, so it's a kind of national trust property now so it's sort of owned by um by this trust that preserves buildings but the families still live in a small apartment in the palace but this is ruined bit as, as well so yeah loads of history but I actually um well before lockdown I used to spend a lot of time in London and I stayed in a hotel that overlooked Hyde, Hyde Park and I actually originally come from the southeast of England anyway so I used to go to London an awful lot and I used to work there so I am able, to, well, I'm hoping when lockdown is lifted, I'll be able to do it again, but can, I can walk around some of these old townhouses in London where I can imagine my heroes and heroines um, living as well in the London setting. So um, yeah, it is a, it's a great feeling to actually physically be in the place that you're writing about. I think it makes it much easier to imagine it and you can, you can do a bit of kind of role play and mm. daydream and imagining your characters wandering through the buildings that, that you're in as well. So um, I'm quite a visual writer as well. I tend to imagine my scenes before I write them. So like last thing, last thing at night when I go to sleep, I'll, I'm kind of dreaming about the characters and some of the dialogue and the I, images. I hear you. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, just, it's lovely. Yeah. Oh, did I, you do that as well? I, I, yeah, own? yeah, I, I do, I do that all the, all the time. Um, and it, it's, it's funny with uh, uh, one, one story that I've got on my slate to start later on this year. Um, there, there was an element that my hero and heroine are, are both after, and it's sort of up until this point, it was just the thing. You know, they're both after this thing, and then one night, it's sort of, I did, I, I dreamt this. Um, this bronze clock with uh, a, a statue clock where uh, uh, oh. where this Grecian maiden is is sort of holding the uh, uh, the clock with the with the pendulum and it's sort of that's the thing that's the thing I didn't even know I, I needed um, 
<laughs> and last weekend, uh, my husband and I started brainstorming the, the whole thing based based on this clock I was describing to him. So, well, that's fantastic. yeah, it's it. You're right when you when you visualize. Uh, there's this movie playing out in front of you that, mm. that you're that you're trying to do justice to as a as a writer. Um, yeah. What do you find? There are some days that is easy, and some days it it's just like it's <laughs> yeah. just like a kid stick drawing. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Sometimes it it just doesn't come, does it? And you you have to just. And this, this happens to me all the time and after every book that I write, I think, is that it? Is there a finite number of ideas? Have I now used them all up and I've got to think of something else to do? Like, I don't know, a road, road sweeper or something <laughs> rather than write. But it, then I find actually the less the less you think about it, the more it happens. So it is actually like when you, when you wake up from a dream, when you try and remember the dream, it just runs away and you can't remember it. But when you sort of don't think about it, it suddenly hits you halfway through the morning that, oh, what I, what I dreamed about so I yeah. found that for um actually a Christmas story that I'm writing at the moment I've really struggled to get the main story out I, I kind of has an idea of the whole overall theme about about Christmas and it just didn't come to me and actually last night and the night before the whole plot plot just hit me between the eyes so I kind of sat up and scribbled it down really quickly so it, it is funny you get days when the, the story just doesn't come and then days when it just hits you and something triggers it off so I'll, I'll go out for a walk and I'll see a, a tree that's a particular shape or something and it sparks off some kind of memory or or idea so um, yeah a bit like your dream with the clock I've had that before I had a, I've had a dream and woken up and I've written an entire book around that one scene in the dream and it's just started off this whole it's like a dropping a stone in a lake and then all these ripples just just come out and all these ideas just grow and grow and grow and then more ideas spark off on those and then you're off again with another entire series of eight books or something. Yes, so it's a, yes. yeah it's funny how it how it happens I mean, my day job is quite logical and systematic so there's always a process for everything it's all set out it's all planned so my my kind of author life is is completely different it's so much more spontaneous with the creativity so it's just weird how that how that works but I found for this ghost story um because I really visualize scenes and really get into them and get under the skin of the characters and how they're feeling and I start crying if my characters are unhappy as well it's really weird when you, you read back your passage that you've written and it makes you cry you think this is just words on a page why is that doing it but I you, find you, you know story. you've hit something you know you've yes. hit something special if this yeah, thing which has resided here which is now here <laughs> that you're now reading here hits you with the emotion it's sort of okay it's working it's it's pulling together as it should which is yeah is and that's kind of the intention isn't it to pull out emotions but I found actually with the with the ghost story it, it didn't really strike me I didn't think about it when I was writing it but I've never written a ghost story before I've read loads but after I'd written one particular scene where things go bump in the night and the sort of scary faces appear in windows and messages on the mist in mirrors when I went up to bed that night I was absolutely <laughs> terrified because all I could picture was this malevolent ghost following me <laughs> up the stairs writing nasty messages and threatening to do horrible things to me and it, it really freaked me out and it was like this is ridiculous this is a story that you've written and I was frightening myself with <laughs> as well so uh, that's been a, a really interesting experience I think writing this particular story I was sort of terrifying myself by doing it you say you read a lot of ghost stories um any any particular favorites oh um sort of spooky stories I like um it's not really a ghost story is it but Bram Stoker's Dracula the mm -hmm. the original story yeah. I've always been a bit fascinated by it there was a um a tv series on in the 1970s I think which I've just aged myself haven't I and I remember seeing it on tv and it just had these amazing special effects and it was it was quite true to the book I think a couple of secondary characters had been taken out but it was it was pretty true to the book and it had Louis Jordan the actor oh yeah um yeah he was in um is it Gigi I think the, yes. the hero and he's I mean he's just so handsome like the most handsome actor I think I just thought he was absolutely gorgeous and this with him being Dracula I could kind of understand the 
sort of mag magnetism that Dracula would have, because I was sort of thinking, mm. yeah, he's Dra Dracula, he's the villain, but actually he's quite <laughs> handsome as well. But yeah. it absolutely terrified me that that particular TV series, it was just, it was so well acted and it was all creepy and the music was creepy and the special effects were, and it was real high behind the sofa stuff. But there've been so many films with Dracula over the years I and mean, obviously with the amazing Christopher, Christopher Lee um, and then lots more modern films and TV yeah. series that the, the story has been kind of watered down over the years. Um, so I wanted to read the original story, which um, it's not written like a story, it's written like letters and journals of all the various different characters in the story. And it's it's so well written and it's actually really, I was terrifying myself when I was reading the book, even though I've seen the film several times and I know that Dracula obviously gets it in the chest with the um, with, with the stake at the end and everything and it's a happy ending. Um, sorry, that's a spoiler, isn't it? But I'm sure you all, I'm sure you all know that. Um, but I was still getting really scared when I was reading the book, even though it was just um, journals from people and, and letters, it was still, that way of writing was still quite visual because you could kind of really imagine it from somebody's sort of heart and soul, how they're, how they're feeling. And just a couple of passages were just so vivid that I was terrified reading reading this book. So, um, but I love it. I kind of, I love to scare myself as well. It's weird, isn't it? Well, you, you're terrified by ghost stories and ghost films. You still want to watch them. <laughs> It's like you get a kind of buzz from being frightened. Well, uh, I guess, I mean, I read this ages ago that um, um, horror stories and things like that, they're a, a way of, there's a psychological underpinning to them, but they're also a way of, of experiencing danger or, or exploring what's a little beyond what we don't know in a way that's, that's safe. Okay, because we yeah. can we can we can close the book we can switch off the tv and go that's all fiction um but i think it it really really hits something innate in us that that sort of we do need to to think beyond well you know is is there life after death is you know what are what are the fundamental push pulls between good and evil it's sort of all these big themes we wrestle with um and and um spooky horror sort of ghostly tales are a great way to explore that i think that's yeah that's i've never really thought about that before but actually that's that's so true isn't it it's a it is a safe space but you can really sort of look at the abyss i suppose, I suppose. yeah and yeah, yeah. looking back at you you sort of yes. know that you're and not then then not you can close the curtain you. on the abyss that's looking at you oh, wow yes yes i didn't, didn't think of that um well i know we had well with our, with our ghost one thing that's a slightly slightly freaky is when we first moved in um which is about 20 years ago now we've we've, we've lived here in the in this little village when we first moved in there were these weird weird sounds going on in the house later late at night and it was just the two of us so you know it's not the, the kids or the, the snakes or the dog or the chicken mucking about and I always wondered whether there was something sniffing around our <laughs> sniffing around our house or floating around our house after we uh, after we moved in so perhaps that wasn't a completely completely safe space but um but I don't know it could be because it's quite an old house that, that we live in so um I know it's like house house noises don't they at night when the wood sort of expands and contracts throughout mm. the day yeah and the night yeah. You, you do get these kind of creaks and things that go bump in the night but yeah occasionally I just wake up and I think I'd hear breathing and the odd painting would would jump off the wall in the middle of the night and you think yeah okay it's probably the nail okay <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it's not happening after a few months so we we do wonder whether it was one of the village ghosts wandering around and maybe she decided after a few months that she approved of us living in the house it's not happened since but um yeah that was an interesting <laughs> interesting experience so I don't know when I was writing the story when I, I had that kind of hack. You know, when you get the hackles at the back of your neck rise, mm. and you think it's a, um, you think it's an urban myth, but it does actually happen. I've had that happen to me when the skin on my neck has gone, and you think, okay, there's something something going on here. And I've had that wandering up the stairs, particularly when I was writing writing this story. And I did wonder, <laughs> is it just my imagination running riot, or or is our local ghost just checking in to see whether I'm writing about? <laughs> <laughs> a, bit, a little bit freaky, but uh, there you go. <laughs> oh wow. 
Well, well, what what is the name of your story? I think we've covered everything apart from that. Everything is. It's um it's haunted heart. So um because the family is the is yeah is the heart family. The whole series is called Headstrong Heart. So a lot of the um titles are a play on a play on the word heart um, and it's spelled h-a-r-t like like the animal but obviously it's a play on, on heart um, so yeah it's called haunting heart it was a, yeah again that was a bit of a no-brainer really um the title that i was i was going to use for that <laughs> oh sorry i don't know if you heard a funny groan that's the dog not <laughs> oh okay i i, I thought i thought we were going to be introducing one of the ghosts maybe <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just a dog. Rest, rest your dirt. He's just come up for a couple. Of days. So, uh, um, he's been sitting very quietly at my feet throughout this interview. Bless him, which is very good. But now he wants some attention. <laughs> Fantastic. Emily, thank you very much for having a chat with me about haunted hearts and uh, that is going to be in the anthology upon a midnight dreary out by dragon blade on october 21 make sure you pick up a, a copy it's only 99 cents on pre-order now grab it grab it before I'm the so ghost gets you 